All right. So uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first, uh, welcome to Something Wicked Film Festival. Uh, we are really happy to be screening your film this year, even though it's only uh, going to be online this year for the features. Uh, some of our shorts will be screening as part of our best of the festival screening. But unfortunately, features are a little bit longer. It's a little harder to try and do that with those. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yes, we want to thank you for uh, joining us this year. And um, what I'd like to do first is uh, to let the, everyone know who you are, what you did on your film, and what your film is. Uh, hi, my name is Rafael Tamira. I'm the writer, producer, director, editor of the film When You're Gone that participated this year in Something Wicked. <laughs> okay, so tell everyone a little bit about what your film is about without giving away any of the juicy details because we want everyone to watch your movie. Yeah, of course. Uh, when You're Gone follows the story of James Taylor. James Taylor is a talented architect and he's on the verge of the financial success that he's always dreamed. And right as he's about to you know, make his dreams come true, a tragedy strikes and he loses his wife in a very tragic manner. And the story comes back a few years later, we don't know exactly how many, we see him trying to move on with his life, you know, have a normal life dedicated only to work without any personal relationships. But as the story advances, we realize that James is a disturbed individual. He, he, you know, he didn't come out very well from the traumatic experience that he suffered. So he has delusions of paranoia. He believes he's being blackmailed. He constantly sees the ghost of his wife haunting him. And we don't really know what's going on and what's real and what's not until the very end when we find out what is really going on in his head. Yeah, good. Don't go any further than that. We have to have people watch the movie. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, this is a little different for us because this year we had a lot of thrillers, which is uh, actually good because I've always been looking for a lot of thrillers and your film fits perfectly within this uh, time, uh, framework. Um, what was the inspiration for this film since you did so many different hats on the film? Uh, you know, when I was growing up, the films that I loved to watch were these films that like kept me on the edge of my seat and I was always trying to guess the ending and then I just couldn't quite guess it. And then like, finally, when it gets to the end, you go like, oh my God, like, why didn't I see that coming, right? Like all the signs are there, but you don't quite get it. Uh, I love the way that those films made me feel when I was a kid. So when I grew up, I always wanted to make a film like that. I wanted to give that experience that I had, you know, to, to other viewers. So that's kind of where the subject uh, matter came from. Uh, funny enough, the story for When You're Gone, I actually wrote it back when I was still studying university. They gave me uh, a homework, like within class, like you guys have one hour to write like a basic idea of, of a feature length film. So I sat down and I kind of wrote like the, the very rough idea of when you're gone. And then later I reread it and I was like, you know, I kind of like this idea. I think I would like to make it a feature. So when I graduated, I sat down, I wrote the script. It took me like a good two weeks to, to like get it, uh, get it right the way that I wanted. And I actually tried to make it back then in uh, 2015 was when I originally wrote the script. But uh, it was a very ambitious project. You know, I'm from Mexico and I always wanted the movie to be in English because psychological thrillers just have such a wider audience. You know, they're in English for the rest of the world. So I wanted to do it with American actors, but it was very complicated. It required a lot of money to bring them down, a lot of logistics. And so I... Uh, persecuted the budget with different ways, product placement, uh, investments. And I just couldn't get it right at the time. So I kind of had to, to can it, put it away, you know, go back to work, do the things that feed you. And then in 2020, funny enough, pandemic hits, everybody's out of a job, including me. And the first two weeks I was like, oh, this is nice. You know, like I get a small vacation. This isn't bad the first vacation in five years because I'm giving myself any vacations. And then after week three, I started getting like that depression of, you know, what am I doing with my life? Like, what are my choices? Like, do I really want to be here right now? And it just kind of hit me. Like, didn't I want to make movies? Like, what have I been doing the past five years to actually make a movie? So I said to myself, well, if I have something right now is time, you know, it's not like I'm going to lose any work from trying to work on my film. 
So I got together with my co-producer and we pre-produced in two months and we shot in a total of 24 days because that's what I could afford. It was self-financed from my savings. (laughs) And yeah, so so that's that's how When You're Gone came to be made, actually. Well, I have to ask this before I forget, because as I was watching your film, I was a little I I was reminded of some of uh, of the old Alfred Hitchcock film. Did Alfred Hitchcock films inspire you or have any type of influence on you? Because I felt a little bit of vertigo in this movie when I was watching. I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, there's definitely some I mean, there's definitely some nods to, you know, all the filmmakers I admire. Like there's some nods in there to Alfred Hitchcock. There is nods in there to Martin Scorsese, to uh, David Fincher. (laughs) Like, yeah, the, that's definitely there. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I, that that came to mind. And then I kept thinking about old uh, Richard Gere movies because he was really good at doing those suspense thrillers that were... Primal you know, Fear. Do you like, I love Primal Fear. So absolutely. good. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly what I was thinking about when I was watching yeah. I was like, oh my God, this, I don't see enough of these films anymore uh, from any filmmakers because everybody wants to go big and everyone wants to go have these really elaborate movies. And, but yours kept the tension and suspense throughout so i was like oh this is a nice nice nicely paced and edited uh uh thriller and i was <laughs> now that you tell me you did you had so many hats on it was surprising that you were able to accomplish so much <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so uh how since you had since you i guess uh, did a lot of the pre-production and stuff during the pandemic did you like go through and rewrite the script really fast or did you just did, was the script already still good after having sat on the shelf for so long and then you just kind of boom this script is perfect let's just go ahead and shoot it pre-production shoot it bam done yeah no we used the exact same script that i had shelved five years before uh we didn't really touch it some of the locations had to change slightly because, you know, originally when I wrote the script, uh, I was thinking of New York as a city, which, which is why the, the budget used to be so big in a sense, because it was either like going to shoot in New York or shoot it in Vancouver. It's a fake New York, you know, like they usually do. And, and then during the pandemic, I kind of had this epiphany where it hit me and I was like, what if I just bring the actors down from the U.S.? and shoot it here and fake it like it's somewhere in the U.S. without ever saying exactly what city it is, you know. As long as it looks, it has the aesthetic of the city that I need to make the story plausible and believable, then it doesn't really matter what part of the world it is. So that's actually what we ended up doing. So some of the locations didn't exactly match, like, you know, what it would have been if we had been in New York, but the scenes stayed pretty much the same. Nice. And so uh, what was one of the most difficult aspects of doing this film? Because you had such a short amount of time to get it done. Was it locations, uh, casting? What was that? Because you. (laughs) Well, I think logistics wise, the most complicated thing was, you know, casting everything remotely because I had to do, you know, virtual castings in the U.S., and then bring down the actors. And I obviously can afford that and, you know, come down for rehearsals or anything beforehand. So like Andrew Forner, you know, the very talented actor that plays the lead, James Taylor, he actually flew down. Like I picked him up at the airport and the next day we started shooting. Like we met and we went directly into shooting the film. And then like we wrapped, we had our wrap party and the wrap party ended at like five in the morning and he was at 6 a.m. back at the airport headed, you know, straight back to L.A., so yeah the the logistics of that were kind of nuts then we had another actor thomas blackburn who plays mark he came down from new york and he could only give us 10 days within his schedule uh even though you know he was an important character so i made like all his scenes fit within those 10 days he comes down we shoot his 10 days and then he had like one day off and then he would head back and then the airline canceled the flight because of COVID reasons, like they didn't even give us a reason. So we lost his ticket and I had to buy him another ticket to send him back to me. So yeah, we had logistic problems like that every now and then. <laughs> That's interesting because I think you're one of the first filmmakers I've spoken to who actually brought actors down into another country to shoot. This is why I'm asking these questions. They're like, this isn't something I've had to talk to any filmmaker yet. So it, what in the five or six years I've been doing these interviews. So it was very, that's very interesting, very interesting, uh, casting wise, because 
<clears throat> I don't usually ask about casting. I usually ask, okay, editing, you know, post production process, but casting is, I don't usually ask about that, but that had to be very interesting for your film, I have to say. Yeah, actually, well, Andrew and I became friends like right away because I did the casting through Backstage and I got like uh, oh, yeah. three, 350 submissions for the character. So, you know, I went through a, a ton of resumes, a ton of demos, and then I asked about 30 of them for an actual like recorded uh, cast. And as soon as I saw Andrews, I was like, that's him. You know, that's the guy I've been looking for. Like, I don't need to look any further. And I immediately emailed him like, hey, man, the role is yours if you want it. <laughs> and he he like didn't buy it. He thought it was kind of weird that, you know, I would offer him the role without like a second callback or anything. So he's like, hey, can we have like a, a Zoom call or something just to like talk? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So we talked and he understood right away, like where I was coming from, that it was a very new project that, you know, my friends were backing me up to, to help me do it, like all the crew and stuff. So we became really good friends and I was very excited to do it. So like every time that I went to a new location, I would take pictures. And I'm like, hey, this is the location that we're going to use for this scene. So he got excited uh, the same way and he started going with his acting coach to rehearse the scenes. And then the, the acting coach would act them with him and record them. And then he would send them to me and then I would give him feedback on the performance. And then he would work with that, with the acting coach and send me videos back. And that's pretty much how we rehearse the film. Interesting, interesting. That's very interesting. Cause I wouldn't, I would never expected any of that, so. All right, so uh, now that we got the casting out of out of play, uh, I want to know that the, I'll get back to what I normally ask is how long did it take for post production for your film? Since pre production was so short and shooting was so short. Yeah, uh, I had the cut of the film, like the actual edit, in fifteen days. I was just really excited about it. I like went through it like crazy. Like I remember. You know, I'd be editing like a full day, like 16 hours, and then I'd go to bed and I'd lay in bed and, I'm like, and I'd start thinking about the next scene. And I'd just be like, oh, my God, yeah, like I need to edit that scene right now. And I would come back to the studio and just start working. And then it would be like 6 a.m. And I'm like, OK, I got to go to sleep for like three hours. And then at nine, I'd get up, have breakfast, start editing again. Oh my God. So, yeah, it took me two weeks to get the, the cut of the film. After that, I screened, you know, like the rough non-color, non-effects, non-music cut uh, with some close friends. They gave me their feedback, and then I just did a re-edit in one day, and that was it. That's that's the cut that we, wow. we ended up finishing. Uh, the other processes of post-production, like color correction, I wanted to do it myself because uh, I do a lot of DP work, so I'm used to coloring my own uh, footage. But my DOP asked me, like, to get a special colorist that usually grades the stuff. And I was like, okay, well, you know, an actual colorist uh, do the work. It took him about three months uh, to do the full color. I went, you know, to do reviews with him. The composer for all the original soundtrack took two months yep. to do all the music. I was, you know, I went to supervise with him and then he'd send me stuff back. And I think sound design was what took uh, a little bit of the longest because some of the some of the locations that we had, you know, they were everything was borrowed. Like we didn't really pay for any of the locations. So some of them had things that were out of our control, like noise and stuff. So some of these scenes had to be done pretty much completely in ADR. So it became complicated with the fact that, you know, my actors were back in the U.S. and so we had to do some ADR with them. Oh. But I think that's what took the most. It probably took uh, sound design from beginning to end about uh, six months. Okay. That's still a relatively short time to, for post-production on a feature. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had, we had to make it realistically within my budget and what I could get and afford. <laughs> understandable. Understandable. I've been production manager on several uh, features, and uh, that whole post-production process, there's only so much time we have. <laughs> Yeah. so much time on post-production and you only have so little money to spread between all the people that you still have to pay on yep. <laughs> and they hear that you did three movies within like a year period is just astronomically crazy yeah i didn't expect that at all i mean you know when you're gone was just like my baby and i wanted to make it and i wanted to get it out of there and then september yeah we shot august september and then 
October, I released the trailer for When You're Gone. And it just kind of generated a lot of buzz here in the local uh, Guadalajara film community because nobody had ever seen anything that looked like that from here because it looks like a film that was done in the U.S. So after that, like a couple weeks later, uh, I got offered to direct uh, a (laughs) rom-com. I don't know if you know uh, Cristo Fernandez. He's uh, from the Ted Lasso series that's big on Apple TV and uh, Warner Brothers right now. He's one of the characters, and he was actually the lead in the romantic comedy that I directed. I did that one in December. Uh, We recorded all through December, pretty much. It was 21 days. It was a little less than one year ago. Uh, That one was post-produced, yeah, around five, six months till we finished uh, the whole thing as well. Uh, I I worked with most of the same crew. This time I did color grade it myself, but I worked with the same uh, composer, with the same sound designer. So we we were pretty quick uh, to finish it because we had already kind of, you know, figure out how each other's work uh, from the first one. And then still from the trailer of When You're Gone in the same uh, December, after I had just wrapped uh, the second feature, I got called to a meeting that they wanted to pitch me a project. And I went... And they were like, oh, you know, we got this artsy film. It's kind of like a road trip in the 80s. And, and I was like, oh, artsy. I don't know, man. I'm, you know, kind of that entertainment <laughs> commercial uh, type deal. Like, I don't know if I can do it. They're like, well, you know, just read the script and like give it a, give it a chance. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, that's fair. So they sent me a script and I, I really didn't like it. And I took a meeting with them to reject it in person, you know, to be respectful. Like, hey, like this movie isn't for me, but I appreciate you think about me. And, you know, I hope we can work in the future. And they were just like dead set on me directing it. <laughs> so I, you know, I threw the hook out there. I was like, all right, if you guys let me rewrite it completely, like I'll just <laughs> take the characters and the basic situation, but I rewrite everything else. Like I'll go for it. And they're like, yeah, yeah. You know, as long as it doesn't cost any more money, just rewrite the shit out of it. Oh my so God. I was like, okay. So I rewrote the script. Uh, I gave it to them. They were happy with it. And then we shot it uh, August, September of this past year, 2021. It's currently in post-production. It's pretty much, uh, it's going to be ready by October. So it's, it's not far from being completed. Okay. Right now I'm just supervising sound design and the original score. Nice. So uh, it, it, is this, where you're heading in your career as a filmmaker, you, you're gonna keep going on to this trajectory. Has this taken over for you for right now, post uh, COVID? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I hope that I do just start directing films as a. I have a very small rental company here in Guadalajara. That's like actually what I do. That's what helps me pay the bills, oh, okay. and it's 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 part of the reason why I was able to shoot with really good equipment for my movie because. I already own the equipment. Like I've been working on my company for the last seven years. So oh, I started with a small black magic camera, you know, the, the first yeah, word yeah. one that looked like an iPad with a lens mount on it. Yeah. I started with that one, you know, seven years ago and I started renting it. And like every time a little money came in, I was like, okay, let's get another lens. Let's get another thing like that. And I started growing it. So by the time that we shot one year gone, I had just bought at the end, uh, yeah, at the end of 2019, like December, I bought a red helium 8K, which was the one that we actually shot the film. Oh, nice. Which is part of the reason why it looks, you know, that good. It has that. As, that as well. if, so uh, I was, well, yeah. was going to say, if you, had, if, you, if you had not told me that it was an indie production that you were shooting in roughly a month, I would have never guessed that having watched the film because the film looks amazing. Uh, like, cinematography is amazing the uh especially the cinematography um like i said it got me right into the whole thriller aspect the way the film was shot and edited especially because it's a hard balance to make a a a, a film suspenseful and uh, keep those thriller aspects uh, through a film because it's mostly done through your cinematography and your editing and your pacing in your movie and that's what I really enjoyed about the movie and I was like okay uh, I wonder how big a budget this movie was this is a... <laughs> but it was micro budget to say the least yeah. <laughs> it's tiny tiny it's almost laughable if I'm honest 
yeah. So, you know, I was lucky enough that I had access to the equipment. Like I had the camera, I had the lenses, I had the camera stabilizer. I'm actually, I work as a camera operator as well here in the industry. So everything that was in motion and the film, like all the tracking shots, I operated them myself. So luckily, you know, I had all that previous experience and I like to plan things like very well. So, you know, I had a very detailed shooting list. I believe it was 760 shots in the film and we shot every single one of them pretty much. I actually did cut down some scenes, um, runtime mostly. Like the original cut was two hours and 16 minutes. The one that you saw is two hours and five minutes. Uh, I actually cut it down because we were going to premiere in movie theaters here in Mexico. And uh, they had a problem with the runtime because they were like, hey, you know, two hours and 16 minutes is a little long because if it's closer to two hours, I can put like three screenings instead of just the two. Uh, I was like, I was like, OK, I'll, you know, I'll cut down the 10 minutes. That's not a big deal. <laughs> Interesting. So, so I cut down a, a few scenes to make that a uh, that a uh, shorter version, which is the one that we ended up uh, keeping at, at the time. But uh, yeah, but we shot pretty much everything that was planned, even though we were you know very constricted in days. I was very lucky that Andrew is such a fantastic actor; like he really is. I've never worked with anybody as dedicated and professional as him before, because we started nicknaming him the Wonder on set because he would get the scenes in the one shot like about 90 percent of the film is just one shot one take oh, wow. of that scene because he would just you know get the performance like we the first two three days it was like you know getting to know each other but he he got to understand what i wanted pretty quickly okay. and since most of the film is him by himself you know the element of the suspense he was just really good at getting exactly what i wanted you know, on the first or second take tops. So that's why we were able to shoot so much within such few days. Oh my God. So I'm, I'm assuming that his little rehearsals with his, uh, uh, his acting coach worked extremely well in the long run for the final film. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I didn't have him rehearse the whole film. I just had him rehearse like the key, you know, the most important scenes yeah. for the film, which were like three really key scenes that required a lot of really good acting from him. And those are the ones that he rehearsed, you know, remotely and everything. Everything else, we went on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, he would learn the lines the day before, he would get on set, and then we'd make it out. <laughs> wow. Wow. That, that's impressive. Uh, now, when I rewatch the film, I have to take all that in perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to like to watch the features uh, uh, over uh, more than most more than one time uh, to, to fully grasp them because I'm always hoping that the, the features always find a wider distribution of some type so that when uh, you guys tell me, okay, it's now on this streaming service. All right, it's now on this DVD service. All right, I can say, I'll post it. I'll say, yeah, this is a, this film finally got distribution. You go watch it here. And I'll say a little tidbit about what I remember about the film. Uh, so... Yeah, I'll have to keep all that in mind, <laughs> especially in terms of uh, his performance and uh, his, his uh, acting in the movie. Because I was going by the thriller aspects. I'm like, oh, this shit's good. I'm going like, to just gonna chill and watch it. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, because the thing is that when we do the film festival, because there's like five of my main crew, and then we have like eight to ten maybe 12 judges or jury members this year. And so sometimes I watch the films with my, my, my crew with me and we're all, cause uh, we're all, we're all watching the film on the big screen uh, that we can project on our own. Cause we all work sometimes at the same place and we're all chilling and watching the films. And most of the time we're going to watch a lot of the horror shorts. We're going to watch the features because those the features are the ones that we don't get to watch up by ourselves as often. So we watch mm -hmm. them as a group. And I said, like, oh, yeah, this feature is good because you can go through a lot of features when we're doing our jobs. And um, at 10 minutes in, we're kind of, can we turn this off? Can, 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 we, can we turn this off? <laughs> yeah. Like, no. I, we, I can imagine you guys get hundreds and hundreds of submissions and not everything's going to be golden. <laughs> yeah, we, we be sitting there like, can we turn? No, we have to watch it through. It might get better 30 minutes in. 
These are indie films. We give them a little bit more leeway than Hollywood movies. For I mean, that's man. that's definitely fair. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. That's the thing is uh, with features, and I give a lot more leeway with features on independent filmmakers because I want you to be able to tell your story, but be able to tell it in a fashion that isn't replicating a, um, a Hollywood film. So if you don't catch me in the first 10 minutes, it's fine. 30 minutes, eh, I'll probably still watch it unless it's something really crazy uh, or really boring uh, uh, or just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But nine right. times out of 10, I'm going to watch the whole movie through. All of us were sitting in front of your movie and like, oh, shit, where's that popcorn at? Kevin, go get <laughs> popcorn. I'm like, I'm not giving you popcorn. I'm watching the movie too. So that's how it was with us. Uh, but That's great to hear. That happens a lot with us because we're a bunch of film geeks too. We all work in the industry. Uh, we're a bunch of film geeks. So when we come across some great shorts or some great features, we're all chilling, drinking, uh, eating popcorn and drinking whatever drink we're drinking. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah, and we're, okay. we're, we're enjoying the films. Hence, while we have our director uh, festival director awards, which are completely separate from our, our main awards, the festival director awards are designed for us as the people behind the scenes to be able to, to tell other people, these are the films we enjoyed as a group. <laughs> you know, our judge and jury, they have more artistic flair and more, more, more artistic ideals, but we are the ones who, you know, we're sitting down, we're enjoying the movies and saying, okay, this is one hell of a movie. It may not have great performances, but damn if I wasn't entertained the whole way through. So. Yeah, right. But <laughs> that being said, uh, I wanted to, to ask you about um, not only about casting, but is there was there anything more uh, also difficult about making this film? Because besides making it in COVID and uh, the, the, the shorter production or pre-production time, um, I mean, for other people watching this interview, you accomplished something that a lot of people will spend five, six years trying to do. You kind of truncated that into a very small amount of time. Is there anything that was difficult or something that you would tell other people to kind of avoid? Or this is one pitfall that might happen if you're trying to make a film in such a short amount of time? Uh, well, the thing, you know, I've gotten asked uh, something similar before. Uh, they always ask me like, hey, you know, if you would have had a big budget, you know, like a, a million dollar budget or whatever, like what would have changed in the film? And I keep telling them, you know, nothing really would have changed. We would have just gotten more hours of sleep because <laughs> one of the things, you know, that came with doing the, the film was originally designed for 20 days. I mean, we planned it for 20 days. We ended up having to add those additional four because one of our first locations, which is uh, the house where James is in, uh, originally they lent us the house they were like you know rich people that oh yeah we support the arts and you know art is beautiful and yeah come in you guys can do whatever you want blah 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 and then you know we get there and they see like all this crew come in and like they see a you know 10 foot crane in their kitchen and they're like ha huh, i don't kind of like this anymore uh -huh. So they started being a little problematic. You know, they would let us in later than we were supposed to get into the house and they would kick us out early. So we started lagging behind on scenes like very early because that was like our from our second to our fifth day of shooting was in that house. And so I quickly at the second day, I just realized these guys are not going to let us shoot like half of the things that we need here. So I told my AD, hey, just schedule for the next two days that we still have here, the spaces that we've already seen, like the kitchen, like the, the living room, whatever. And I'll find another location for the rest of the house. So I did. And while I was there in the shoot, I called up some friends and I got a deal to get us another house that was big, that kind of had the similar style. And then we just ended up adding those days. Uh, that's why we ended up shooting 24 instead of 20. Oh, wow. But because of that, you know, it, we had a lot of scenes to get. Like you saw the two hour and five minute cut, but it was originally two hours and 16 minutes. And the two hours, 16 minutes cut, I did cut a little stuff out from that one as well in my very first cut. So we had a lot of things to shoot. And some of the scenes were fairly complicated. Like, you know, that one scene where he goes upstairs and his gun drawer is open and he, and he takes out the gun. Yeah, 
that one scene was very complicated. It took us over 10 hours to shoot it because it's all practical effects. It's all real in camera. None of that is CGI. So for us to get it exactly right, real, and in the moment, it took a while because there were elements that we couldn't control. Oh, wow. okay. So because of that, you know, we had some really long days. Like there was this one time that we had. Also, I was able to bring down the main uh, cast from the U.S., but I couldn't afford to bring everyone down from the U.S., you know, and that includes the bit players. So I had to find some people here that were wow. native English speakers or spoke perfect English. And, you know, some of them I didn't get. Uh, my, uh, my co-producer got them. And, you know, one of them was never fully informed that they had to act because they were just used to being like the background tough guy that crosses his arms in music videos. So he, he got to the set and he didn't know his lines. So we had a very complicated scene that he had a lot of lines to say in that scene and he didn't know them. So I had to do like, all right, learn these three words. All right, action. He said those three words. Okay, cut. Now learn these three words. So because of things like that, you know, that happen when you have a small budget, like days turn to 20 hour days, you know, and then it's like, go sleep three hours and come back and do another 20 hour day. Oh, and, you know, I wish I could have given more. I remember I apologized a lot to Andrew because, you know, <laughs> he comes from LA. So he's used to like his eight hour days. And if they go one hour over, he starts getting paid like triple and everything. And I was just like, man, you know, I'm so sorry. Like, I really wish I could do something about it, that this wasn't such a heavy shoot. And he, he was very understanding. And he's like, you know what? You're giving me the opportunity of a lifetime to, to star in a, in a future. So, like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm here 110%. He still is to this day. Like, he's, he's been helping me submit to film festivals. We've been doing it together, you know, because he's very involved in the film. Uh, so it was a great experience. But, yeah. I mean, definitely, if you're going to shoot very few days and your project is very ambitious, then <laughs> get ready to not sleep. Like, seriously. Yeah, well, no, I, I was actually even crazier because I would shoot a scene. If I shot a scene that I really liked, I just wanted to see it edited. So when <laughs> I would get home after shooting, I would cut it that day. And then I would show up on set and I'd show it to them on my phone. Like, the actors, like <laughs> look at the scene we shot yesterday. It's so cool. And they'd be like, when did you get time to do that? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I'll forgive you for that because I've been on film sets where uh, the director was just as excited after shooting. We'd be there. I'm production managers. We've been here 16, 20 hours. Can we go home? And then the next morning, the first thing he tells me is he's been sh editing all night. The scene that we just shot. I was like, oh, OK, this is what you've been doing. It is cool. Don't get me wrong. Because uh, I worked with a lot of people who like to put a lot of monsters. So uh, yours, <laughs> <laughs> my career has been doing a lot of hardcore horror and monster films. So uh, hearing your stories about your thriller is much more um, much more interesting for me sometimes. Because uh, yeah. it's very different from the films that I've worked on. Uh, <laughs> so my, my thing is usually spending hours and hours uh, getting people with the makeup or costume. Right. And then doing one little blood effect. And then we go home after 12 hours of doing that. Yours is like working with your actors for like 20 hours, hammering out these scenes. Like you, know, you did like 20 scenes in one day. We barely got through one scene. Yeah, I think our average was about 15 scenes a day. <laughs> uh, yeah, now I'm envious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a deeper conversation in how to, how to help filmmakers get through a lot of scenes really fast when you're on a tight shooting budget and tight shooting schedule. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I guess as any filmmakers, we have to get used to it. But for example, my last film, it wasn't as ambitious. It was four characters, road movie, stranded on the side of the road. <laughs> but we shot it in 11 days, the entire oh, 11 days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you have 20 hour days on that one too? No, because everything was natural light because it all happened during the day. So we could start from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's what the light gave us. We had 12 hour days. That's it. Interesting. We couldn't stretch it anymore because the turn night, the turn night, we couldn't use it. That is in 11 days. Wow. Yeah. 
So for other indie filmmakers watching this, do your movie during the daylight hours and uh, just shoot from sun up to sundown and then be done for the rest of the day. <laughs> All right. Yeah. The, the, uh, that was definitely a, a different challenge. It was a tough one, but it was interesting. Also, <laughs> uh, all my, my features have been completely different genres. Like, you know, there's the psychological thriller, which is when you're gone. Then there's a romantic comedy, which is Who Speaks Love. And then this is a drama with some thriller elements. Because I rewrote the script, I added some thriller elements to it to make it more my style. But it's mostly drama. Like, it's mostly between the characters. So they're very different from each other. So, so I'm hearing you got rid of all the artistic type of film elements from the original script. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I can't stand, you know, those pretentious films that just after you're watching like a shot that doesn't move or doesn't do anything for like 10 minutes. I can't stand that. It's awful. You know, oh. mo movies can be entertaining and still be good is what I've always thought. You know, you don't have to be pretentious to be artsy. Oh my god <laughs> oh man uh you're hilarious uh but uh you ha are absolutely right uh because a lot of indie films I, I i used to see when i used to do an international film festival used to be exactly like that you could be entertaining as well as telling a good story without being pretentious but you know unfortunately uh, as many films as i've seen and i used to focus on indie film uh indie films international independent films uh our film festival is now is a genre film festival. I used to do a regular film festival before this, but we did a lot of films like that. And it was like, okay, <laughs> I understand. I get the point. Later. So like I said, with your film, it is very refreshing in regards to the cinematography and the editing because the pacing works so well. And the pacing works so well, even when there's you have like your your main character is the focal point for the whole movie. So you're you're following him on his journey, but it's not in the pace. I come back to pacing because pacing is everything when it comes to uh, indie films. Uh, the pacing is not so that you start dozing off or you start. Um, uh, you want to get up and go to the bathroom. I can't, I can't think of the word that I'm thinking of. But the yeah, idea, like you're losing the attention. You're losing the attention, yeah. Your film is the one of those films where it's like, oh, wow. You, you're, you're engaged the whole way through, and the pacing keeps it so that you don't want to get up. You want to keep watching. You want to keep knowing what the heck's going on. So uh, that's one of the things that I love about w watching the feature films, and your film especially, because that's an aspect that I don't see a lot, because a lot of indie films, especially – and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself with some of my films, we kind of rely on the monster to, to the monster to drive the story and keep people interested. Whereas in your film, um, it's more or less the story, the actor who is whole, carrying most of the whole film and the way yeah. the film is made. So a testament to your film in that regards, because that's a hard balance to make or have in an indie film, because especially if you're the person writing, producing, directing, editing, and never doing everything like that because sometimes you are too close to the material and sometimes you can't actually see where you might have problems because you're too close to the story. Um, I don't honestly didn't see that type of problem when I was watching the movie. So uh, it, and because I don't look at the credits when I'm watching a movie, I literally go blind. I don't watch trailers. I don't read the synopsis. I go blind watching your movie. I didn't know you did all the hats. <laughs> until yeah. now i didn't know you did all the hats until now so it was like one of those things where i was like oh wow he accomplished that and he did all of that too okay okay and then you went off and did two other feature late films in completely different genres so <laughs> a testament to your hard work uh, uh on that regard dude because that's i don't think i've ever heard of anybody who shot three features in such a short amount of time <laughs> yeah i I remember I was talking to my mom the other day and she was like, oh, you should be doing the next one. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I've done three in 14 months. Like, it usually takes a Hollywood director to make a film like every three years, like, you know, on average. Like, I need a break. Uh, yeah. I keep telling the, the guy that works here with me at the rental business because he goes with me to the movies. He's a focus puller, a really good one. Yeah. He's been a focus puller on the three films. He also helped me operate camera on a on a few scenes when I hurt my back. Cause you know, all of us operators that carry those big rigs, we have back problems eventually. And 
I was like, dude, don't let me like accept any other future projects for like a year. He's like, <laughs> he's like, come on, man. I know you. Like, even if I tell you no, you're still gonna go for it. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> as long as long as if you don't like the script, you get to rewrite the script. You have full control over that, then you'll do it. <laughs> yeah, actually, right now I um the same people that financed the last film that I did, the the road movie. Uh, I, I got called back to their office like a couple months ago because the reason it was made on such a small budget and it really was a shame because uh, the, the actors were good. It, it turned out pretty good considering, you know, the 11 days. It was because he had kind of been swindled by two other production companies and they'd, they'd made him spend a lot of money on these two really crappy movies that he couldn't sell because they were just really badly and amateurishly made. Hmm. They lost a lot of money on them. So he didn't want to risk any big capital on a film anymore. So they convinced him to make this third film on like a really small budget to guarantee that, you know, his money would actually come back this time in comparison to the other two films. And he was the one that wanted me to direct it because he saw the trailer for One Year Gone. And then I, I went to his office recently because he called me back and he's like, hey, man, you know, I really want to apologize to you. I'm like, why? What's up? He's like, because the movie's really good with like a shitty budget and, you know, 11 days. Like if I if I would have given you decent money and, you know, let you choose the cast, it would have been like another level of film. I'm like, oh, yeah. I mean, I did warn you guys about that, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad you you realize it. So he's like, hey, I really want to keep making movies with you. So like, do you have any other ideas? And I pitched them an idea that I've had uh, for a while that I developed with a friend. It's a horror thriller. And <laughs> he was interested in it. And so I, you know, I came back and I started writing the script. I wrote it in seven days <laughs> and I, I sent it to him and he hasn't read it yet because he's a pretty busy guy. He's a businessman of other sorts. He's not exactly in the film industry, but he's excited to work with me. So I'm hoping, you know, he'll, <laughs> he'll be into it and he'll want to finance it because I really want to make that movie. Nice. And it's it's more back to my style, you know, it's thriller, it's horror, it's got the elements. Yeah, but from what I understand now, it's uh, it's good that you're able to go in and out of your own genre to uh, to work on other uh, other other films. Uh, but hopefully, and I I really do hopefully that when you come across one that's not in your wheelhouse genre, the producers will allow you to the freedom to augment it and change it to fit something that fits you more. So it doesn't seem like you're making some random film for hire uh, and it doesn't fit within your style of your other films. So, yeah, though- I, I also rewrote the romantic comedy because uh, <laughs> it was originally written by Christo, actually the actor and his girlfriend and their co-protagonists in the film. And I love the idea. Like it was really sweet. But, you know, it had a lot of the typical uh, rom-com cliches, like the bad jokes and like the third act where everything just magically fixes itself. And I didn't really like that. And I was like, hey, you know, if we're going to make a romantic comedy, let's make it a little different. So I, I rewrote like pretty much all, all the jokes. And one of them is going to have to lose something because that's how life really works. Like it just can't be like magically everybody gets what they want. And so I rewrote it for them and they really liked it. So that's the script that we ended up going with. Nice, nice, nice. All right. <laughs> well, uh, it has been a pleasure talking with you here <laughs> for the last hour or so. Uh, but before we go, I would like you to say something uh, for the people watching in regards to either your film or um, uh, filmmaking in general so that you leave them with something uh, after this. Because I would normally say, well, what are you working on na- uh, next? But I've got like the conversation for the next three projects that you've worked on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, my advice out there would be like to, you know, indie filmmakers that aspire to, to make movies like I aspire to make them. Um, you know, don't wait for the opportunity because it will just never come. Like, I think we've, we've all seen in that sense where we're just kind of hoping somebody will call us someday and be like, Hey, you know, go direct this movie for me or, or something like that. It, it happened to me with When You're Gone, you know, when I was chasing the, the budget for a while and I just couldn't get the budget right here in Mexico. So I even tried in the US and 
I was in contact with an indie producer in the US who made, you know, $5 million films in the US, which is huge here. Like, I wish I could add that budget. And he read the script and he, he called me and he was like, hey, you know, I really like your script. Uh, it's good. But can I be honest with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. What's up? He's like, you're never going to make that movie because they don't give that movie to nobodies and you're nobody. You know, if you want to see that movie made, you should sell it, sell the script. And, you know, I guarantee you somebody will make that movie and you'll eventually see it in theaters. But you're not going to make it. Nobody's going to give you the opportunity to shoot a film like that when you have, you know, no body of work prior to it. And I was like, well, he's right. You know, why would anybody come in and be like, hey, here's, you know, these million dollars to go and make this film. He was absolutely right about it. So in 2020, I decided to give myself the opportunity. And, you know, it's 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 worked out well. The film has been in a lot of festivals around the world. It's getting good attention. It's a uh, sign for a distribution platform for the U.S. and Canada. So, you know, give yourself the opportunity because definitely nobody else will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, please let us know uh, where uh, other people will be able to watch the film or we'll make sure to uh, post it everywhere uh, because we I always want everyone to be able to catch the films if they can't catch it at our film festival. So please tell us where it's uh, streaming or playing or anything like that. We'll make sure to post it for you. Um, also, I want to wish you continued luck in this the film festival's uh, circuit for this film and your other films uh and nothing but success and i'm looking really forward to the next uh film you send to us so thank you for joining us uh for this little conversation and um that's all i have for you today <laughs>